Hi, I'm Suzanne Perkins. I'm the Michigan Support Group Facilitator. I'm also a cognitive neuroscientist and I teach at the University of Michigan. I'm the mother of an adult daughter with myotonic dystrophy one, and we discovered we had myotonic dystrophy in our family when she was diagnosed at 16. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Andy Berglund, who will begin talking with us about many of the key scientific discoveries that have allowed researchers, clinicians, and the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries to develop therapeutic strategies for DM. Dr. Berglund is currently director of the RNA Institute in Albany, New York, and serves as professor of biological sciences at the University at Albany and at the University of Florida. His scientific career has revolved around understanding the role of RNA in biology. The focus of his lab is neuromuscular diseases with the goal of translating basic science into therapeutic strategies using a combination of biochemical, cellular, genomic, and computational approaches. Research in his lab has focused on RNA splicing with an emphasis on understanding the mechanisms of myotonic dystrophy, as well as other microsatellite diseases such as ALS and ataxia. Uh, welcome, Dr. Berglund. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I just wanted to take a few minutes to tell, your, tell everyone about myself and first to thank MDF for uh, giving me the honor to give this talk. It's, I'm really honored. Um, so just a little background about myself. Um, Suzanne gave you more of the science side. I want to give you a little bit of the personal side of why I'm so passionate about myotonic dystrophy or DM. So in 2002, as a brand new assistant professor at the University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon, I was introduced to myotonic dystrophy. I don't think I'd really heard of it. And it was my very first undergraduate student who introduced me to myotonic dystrophy. His mother was affected with myotonic dystrophy. And as a, I think a sophomore uh, in college, this particular student, you know, kept talking to me about myotonic dystrophy, saying, you know, we should work on it. And I must admit initially, I was a little like, wow, I don't know if I can do this. Um, but, you know, he was really persistent and we kept having great conversations. And so he was the first person to start working on myotonic dystrophy in my lab in, um, probably mid 2002. And so that really sort of jump started um, the research and got me excited about it. And, you know, it took us a little bit of time to really engage. And it wasn't until we had our first publication in 2005 and the student went and presented the work uh, at an MDF conference or an international myotonic dystrophy conference where we still got really excited about the research and, and moved forward. But I would say for the last 18 years, you know, I've really thought hard about myotonic dystrophy. I'm really passionate about it. And it's to the point now where um, I'm proud to say I have two of my team members uh, who work on, on, on research in the lab and their family is directly affected by, M by DM. So we're, as a group, really passionate. And I have been lucky to recruit an amazing team to work with me. Several of the researchers have actually even a little more uh, experience in DM than I do. I have one with 20 years of experience and I have a couple of MDF fellows, um, past MDF fellows and current MDF fellows that work with me. So MDF is a major part of what we do. Um, and I think with that, I will um, transition to my talk and then I'm, I wanted to make sure I left plenty of time for questions at the end. Okay, uh, hopefully everyone can see my slides, um, starting with understanding the foundations of DM research. I'm just gonna assume you can unless I hear otherwise. Okay, um, you know, I think one of the things that is always helpful is to put in context myotonic dystrophy and a timeline is something to think about. And so some of you may have pieces of this, but I, I wanted to sort of put it all together. Um, so as many of you might be aware, it was first sort of discovered or really um, as a group discovered in, uh, two, in 1909 by a clinician, Dr. Stein, Steinert. Um, and really there's, you know, about almost 50 years of a descriptive phase. And then, you know, in the 
uh, it switched to a more molecular phase. And we're going to talk about both the descriptive phase to sort of lay the foundation of understanding myotonic dystrophy and then spend a lot of time talking about the more molecular aspects of myotonic dystrophy because that's really important for you know, moving towards therapeutics and clinical trials and that. Um, and I will say this is posted in um, one of the, I'm not sure if you call it a box, but it's somewhere that's posted and I believe this talk will be recorded um, or we'll make the slides available, obviously. Um, and I should say, um, you know, this is not all inclusive. This is just highlighting some of the great research um, on the backside. You know, I could have done five slides on all the amazing research that's been done by all my great colleagues. So if any of my colleagues are, are listening out there, know that I didn't, you know, I, I, wa I wanted to include everyone, but it's just not possible to put everyone on the slides. Um, okay, so the early days of myotonic dystrophy, um, and it, at one point it was called Steinhardt's disease. That's frequently how um, diseases are named by the clinician that identifies um, the disease and reports on it. And so this was, and prior to 1909, there were isolated reported cases in the literature, but they weren't grouped as a single disorder or disease. And so in 1909, uh, Hans Gustav Wilhelm Steinhardt um, made this characterization, had this group of patients, and he originally um, called the disease dystrophin myotoniker. And so he did this description with six patients with atrophy and myotonia. And we'll spend some time talking about myotonia. And by the end of the talk, hopefully you have a better understanding of the molecular mechanism that causes this myotonia. And it was at the medical clinic of the University of Leipzig. Um, and it was this combined patient observation with review of 26 other public cases and autopsy studies that really built the foundation uh, for myotonic dystrophy. And in 1912, Hans Kirschman validated the multi-organ system involvement of DM. And that's something that I'm sure many of you think about in the community is sort of how it affects so many parts of, of the body in different ways. And then lastly, a fun fact, he married uh, Ilse Lohenheim, the first female German ophthalmologist. Um, okay. Uh, again, sort of continuing with the early days of myotonic dystrophy, Dr. Flesher and Greenfield described cataracts in older generations of families with, with myotonic dystrophy, and, and in that case, frequently with no muscle abnormalities. So I think it may have been a thought that this was a, an eye disease. In 1947, Dr. Bell publishes the first full family in genetic studies of large family trees, and she, she described what today is known as anticipation. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about anticipation and, and providing that hopefully that molecular understanding for the community. Uh, so in 1960, Dr. Vanier described that many adults with myotonic dystrophy had different symptoms and seemingly different onset, as well as a, as a description of congenital myotonic dystrophy. Again, sort of this, that myotonic dystrophy is such a broad, affects a broad range in a broad, in a broad way. And then, you know, back to that anticipation, it was documented this time, but many geneticists actually didn't sort of believe it because they thought it had to do with the clinicians with diagnosing things at different times and maybe it wasn't being accurately recorded. Um, because anticipation is sort of specific to repeat expansion diseases. Okay, so maybe many of you have thought about family trees and, and we're gonna use these to, to help you understand genetic anticipation. And, and the dynamic nature of myotonic dystrophy. I'd say that's one of the things I hope I'm able to share with you is sort of the idea of how um, the, there's this anticipation and that the mutation may, uh, in a sense, get worse with time and age, okay? Um, and I'm realizing I can use my pointer to help me. So here's a, an example of a family tree and the ones with a, um, filled in circle or square are those that are affected. And one of the first things to notice here is that in every generation, right, first generation, second, third, and fourth, there's affected family members. So myotonic dystrophy is a disease that affects every generation. And in general, disease severity worsens in each generation, and we'll talk about that. And the age of onset tends to be earlier in each generation. And these are clues for a dynamic genetic process. So just to take a step back, because I'm sure not all of you think about DNA and RNA and proteins all the time, we'll spend a little bit of time thinking about, you know, 
the central dogma or you know what it what does DNA and RNA and protein do so a lot of people like to think about DNA as the blueprint of life right so this DNA um, you know you have three billion base pairs in in all your cells and that's your blueprint okay and that DNA is static and um, what it does is it makes a transient copy, which we call RNA or ribonucleic acid. And that RNA, we're going to talk a lot about uh, during this meeting because it's that RNA that's that toxic RNA related to myotonic dystrophy. Okay. But in general, what happens is you have this DNA, this static um, genetic material. It makes multiple copies of DNA into RNA. And that RNA codes for proteins that do a lot of the work in the cells and in your body. Um, and, it, and of course, importantly, your DNA, your blueprint transmits the traits from one generation to next. And this is supposed to represent flowers and how you can uh, breed and select for flowers and, and select for traits. So that idea that you can correlate back to Mendelssohn's experiments, um, right? Okay. So uh, just to sort of dive into the molecular aspects, and many of you, uh, you know, either affected by myotonic dystrophy or a family member or thinking about this as identification of the mutation that causes DM1 or myotonic dystrophy type 1. And it was in, the in 1992 that some key work was done that identified the expansion and just sort of here's that representation of DNA. And here actually you're, you're looking at a image of a gel, okay? And myotonic dystrophy was the third repeat expansion to uh, discovered and now there's almost 40 or more of these different repeat expansions and we're going to talk a lot about CTG repeat expansions because that's myotonic dystrophy type 1. We'll talk about type 2 in a little bit um, and it's and on this gel you can see an unaffected individual which is represented by an N or DM for myotonic dystrophy and you can see that in the DM there is this extra band or a larger band and these larger bands that are in the DM lanes represent the larger CTG repeat fragments. And this was sort of the first you know, clue that these repeats were there and large, okay? But something that's sort of worth remembering is that it's not just in one location that repeats exist. C repeats are sort of throughout our genome, all of us, and it's in certain regions of the genome that these repeats expand. And for individuals with myotonic dystrophy, it's in one particular region. And for myotonic dystrophy too, it's in a completely different region of the genome. Okay, just to give you a little more molecular uh, background how this works. Um, so you have that DNA, right? And you can isolate the DNA from a cell, okay, or tissue. You isolate the DNA. Um, and for those of you who are interested in this type of thing, you can actually do this uh, at home with strawberries. You can isolate strawberry DNA and sort of see it in a tube. It's sort of fun to do with, uh, with kids and as actually as, as anyone. It's fun to see that DNA. Um, so here you isolate the DNA and then we use something called the restriction enzymes and they are literally molecular scissors. They cut the DNA up into small little fragments. This, we restrict them or cut them up, okay? And then step two is this gel and it's really, it's a matrix and you're running DNA fragments through the gel, okay? And then you're going to transfer those DNA fragments onto a membrane, that's a transfer. And then you cross-link the DNA to the membrane and then you do a hybridization step and it's a, it, tends to be radioactive, but it can be other types of approaches. And it allows you to isolate these DNA fragments. And then you can visualize them and you can see these expansions. And so the little red arrow is the expansion and the blue is the unexpanded, okay? And something we'll talk a lot about is that, when I meant to say this back on that original sort of DNA, RNA proteins, on DNA, you have all these genes. You probably hear about genes. Well. You, tend, you have two copies of genes and they're alleles, one you inherited from your mother, one you inherited from your father, okay? And so you have two copies and in myotonic dystrophy, it's almost always the case that you just have one copy that's expanded and then you have one gene that's not expanded. So you have an expanded gene and, a, and an unexpanded. And sometimes we'll use the word allele for that as well. Okay. And uh, Eric Wang and I, and I hope you guys all go listen to Eric's talk later, we were, were brainstorming a few nights ago and we came up with this idea of using trees as an analogy for thinking about repeats. 
So, you know, I just introduced the two genes, right? So you have, or two alleles. So you have the normal allele, and that tends to be sort of a nice small little tree in the forest. And then when you have large CTG repeats, you have this expanded allele. It's a really large tree, right? So this is the DNA level and at the RNA level. Um, and so that's the way we're, we're gonna hopefully use this analogy and maybe some of you are rolling your eyes at me, but hopefully it helps, okay? Um, so, and one of the things that I hope you all take away from this is that it's not the same sort of expansion in every part of your body, okay? So as in unaffected individuals, okay, or, or your unaffected allele even, you have all these little trees that all look the same basically. Maybe there's a little bit of modification, but not much, right? And it's the same in the skin, in the gut muscle, uh, I'm in the gut cells, in the liver, central nervous system or the brain, the heart and the muscle. But interestingly, in myotonic dystrophy, these trees are really expanding or, or are different. And they actually can be different from cell to cell. So in the skin, they may be relatively short. Or in the blood, you may get a report back that you have 120 repeats in your blood, but that's not always going to represent what's happening in the gut, the liver, the central nervous system, the heart, or the muscle. And again, there's this variation of these, of these repeats and they cause your forest to be a little different. So there's lots of variation uh, at that DNA level or in the forest as we continue with our analogy. Okay, so something you may be all wondering is, well, how do these trees expand and get large when they should all be this nice Christmas tree farm, right? So what's happening is at the DNA level, we have our template, okay? That's the copy of your, of your blueprint, okay? And you have to make copies of it. So you know, every time you're making a new cell, you're copying the DNA and making a new, um, temp, a new version of the DNA. And what can happen is when you're copying the DNA, you can get either contractions or expansions. In this case, I'm showing you, because this is the template you're copying, if you get some of the DNA to loop out, you'll actually have a little bit of a contraction in your repeat that tends not to happen as much as you'd like in DM. It tends to be the opposite where it's an expansion. So here's the template, you know, you have your CTG repeats and you make a copy. And I didn't go through this because if you really want, you can look it up, but you know, a, a G and a C always base pair, an A and a T base pair. Um, and so you have these rules of base pairing with DNA, but you make a copy. But what unfortunately happens is you get an expansion. And so you get, a little bit of growth. And so these CAGs get added and they shouldn't have been added. So there's an expansion of your repeats and then it gets copied on the other strand. And then you have this larger region. And in general, it's contracting and expanding, but in, it tends to expand over time uh, as you get more um, uh, copies of the DNA made. Okay. So, and then thinking about this repeat expansion, this there's different, ways it can cause a disease. You can get um, this repeat expansion can lead to turning off a gene. And if you're turning off a gene because of these expansions, because the forest has grown too much, the trees, you're shutting the, a gene off and that can lead to Friedrich's ataxia or fragile X intellectual disability or Jacobson's syndrome. Um, but like with myotonic dystrophy, you can get through, you make the RNA, but now you have this RNA and this RNA is a problem, okay? And it causes disease at sort of the RNA level. And this is myotonic dystrophy type one and type two, but also ataxias. And more recently, Fuchs corneal dystrophy, an eye disease, um, has been shown to be caused by this repeat expansion. And it's not always quite this simple. I'm probably simplifying it, but you know, as you learn more, you can sort of expand out and, and build out your knowledge. So the RNA causes the disease. And then, you know, maybe one of the more famous repeat diseases is Huntington's disease. And that's at the, primarily at the protein level, but it could be happening a little bit at sort of other levels. And that's a polyglutamine expansion where Huntington's disease, and you have an expansion at the protein level. And so you have a protein that has extra parts to the protein and it causes problems for the cell and the body. So Huntington's, as I said, is probably the most famous, but there's also, spinocerebellar ataxia type one and SBMA. Um, so, and, and as I said, in just the last year, there's been a few more completely brand new repeat expansion diseases discovered in different parts of the genome. So as we continue to study the genome, we, we learn more diseases. 
And I would say one of the strengths of that, just for this community to understand, is that when we learn something about another repeat expansion disease, that frequently helps us understand myotonic dystrophy. So there's a lot of sort of cross learning. So, you know, you may, when you read about researchers, you may say, well, why are they working on not just myotonic tissue? Why are they working on ALS or other diseases? And one of the reasons we do that is it helps us learn a lot about DM by studying other diseases and vice versa. What we learn in DM helps the ALS community and, and vice versa. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I told you 1909, we knew about myotonic dystrophy or Steinhardt's disease, but why did it take so long to discover the, the, the cause? It, it's tough. It's the symptoms can vary widely across patients. Um, the symptoms are similar to those seen in other neuromuscular diseases. And, and then actually, as I was hopefully explaining to you, repeat size is different across different tissues. So there's that somatic instability, a term we use to describe that, this differences in sort of the way the forest is. Um, but it, it really makes it hard because, you know, if someone has a, mod, a sort of a mild form or their symptoms look like something else, it's tough for the clinicians and for the doctors to diagnose this. You know, I've talked to many of, of the families in the, in the DM community and, you know, I, I hear about that and how it's hard and sometimes they're not diagnosed for many years. Um, and so the, hopefully the more education we do and the more of us that talk about it, the better that's, it's going to decrease that time to diagnosis. Um, but that's sort of a different part of this discovering the cause. Um, and as many of you are probably aware, you know, cataracts, retinal damage, uh, cognitive function, there's intellectual impairment, behavior and psychological disorders, excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, and then yeah, it impacts the bone, the immune system, skin, respiratory, uh, breathing difficulties, aspiration, sleep apnea, the endocrine system, reproductive system. The GI, that's something that, you know, I think I heard at a meeting many years ago, and actually an MDF fellow started a whole research program around building a zebrafish model to get a better understanding of the GI system so that we could model it in fish. And it was that, those interactions with, with, with the MDF family, the group that helped us determine that was a really important area of research. So Melissa Hinman at the University of Oregon is doing that work. Um, and then, of course, the muscle that, you know, I think everyone sort of thinks about, and of course, it's really important, but I would say many of us are starting to appreciate how important the, the, this, the cognitive, sort of lots of other parts are. So the weakness, the wasting, the myotonia, the pain, the atrophy. Um, okay, so, you know, what, what makes DM unique or special? It's that repeat instability. So the majority of other mutations that cause human disease are stable. So once the mutation happens, it's there, it's inherited, it keeps going. But with myotonic dystrophy, there is this variability, there's this change um, with the, like as the forest and with the trees we talked about. And then also it's this difference in repeat length in the different organ systems, okay? The length in blood is different, say, from in the muscle. There's going to be differences in your repeats. And even within the muscle, as you measure the repeats say in different cells in a muscle, you can even see differences at that level. Okay, that's that semantic expansion. And then intergenerational expansion. As I said, the repeat size generally gets larger as passed down through generations causing more severe symptoms. And that's really that anticipation. That's where, you know, potentially say a grandparent has, you know, 100 repeats or 150. Um, the, the, the first, the, 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 Child, the parent has say 200, 250 repeats because it's expanded, there's that been expansion. And then the grandchild has you know, 700 or 1,000 repeats. So that's that expansion happening in the families. Um, and so you know, partly why you know, I really did get ex interested in this disease, not just the personal connection, is that I was an RNA biochemist from, for many years before starting this. And it's you know, and this is why I'm a good fit to be director of the RNA Institute is it's a toxic RNA disease. So we think a lot about toxic RNA and, and my lab and many labs think about, well, how can we turn off the toxic RNA? How can we degrade the toxic RNA? And you'll hear a lot about that from uh, Dr. Uh, Eric Wang when he talks about those sort of therapeutic approaches. But let's set the stage with thinking about this. So we talked about the DNA and you have the CTG expansions. Well, when you 
transcribe or turn that DNA into RNA, it's CUG repeats and you can have literally hundreds or thousands of CUG repeats. And that's that toxic RNA. And so it was Dr. Swanson and Robert's teams that identified the first proteins that are bound by toxic RNA. So it's not just toxic RNA sort of naked in the cell. It's um, coated with proteins. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Hop, Drs. Hoffman, Radvini, and Gordon's teams developed the first mouse models with CUG repeats and inserted them into the genome, which uh, showed anticipation and really sort of was that demonstration uh, what was seen in the patients you could model in mouse. And one of the things that, you know, I think you probably hear a lot in the community is mouse models. Well, I just hope to convince you that these are really important tools. And by modeling what's happening in, in the patients in the mice allows us to have these tools to understand what's happening, develop therapeutic approaches and use those mouse models. Um, Dr. Tom Cooper's group showed that the CUG binding proteins help process RNA and are responsible for making proteins controlling muscle. So this was some of that fundamental biochemistry. And this, you know, I'd say Tom is one of those sort of perfect examples where basic fundamental science is critical to understanding mechanisms. And I'm just sort of pointing out his work because he's been doing it for many years, uh, sort of critical work. Um, so thinking about the myotonic dystrophy is you have you know, oh, and I sort of skipped over this, you know, some of you may not care exactly how this works, but the gene or the open reading frame, that is what codes for proteins, right? And so we tend to, you know, I would say when I first was introduced to biochemistry, we thought a lot about just the protein. And we thought about the RNA, but we actually didn't care so much about the region of the RNA that didn't code for proteins. So now many of us appreciate how important that is. And it's at the DNA level, these repeats are outside of the open reading frame. So it doesn't necessarily code for a protein. Um, it, it codes for an RNA. And as I said, you can have short repeats. Those uh, don't seem to have, don't have an effect in terms of, of causing disease. You can have these mid-level repeats where you may not ever have symptoms. And then you have the hundred to thousands of repeats where you're going to have symptoms of myotonic dystrophy. And it's really this toxic RNA. And it's not a one-to-one. -one. We're showing one DNA to one RNA, but in reality, you tend to make about five of those toxic RNAs from the DNA on average, okay? And then that RNA gets coated by proteins. And we, we talk about these proteins and they're these little blue spheres, but they're of course more complex than that. And they recognize the toxic RNA and get coated on the toxic RNA, but really they should be doing all sorts of other things in your body. They're supposed to be regulating lots of processes. And so it's like a, a toxic sponge is soaking up proteins and it shouldn't be happening. And so that's why it's toxic. So you have this sequestration of proteins. You can also have something that we'll spend a little bit of time talking about called RAN translation, where you're making proteins that shouldn't be there and they're coming right off this toxic RNA. And this was a, a really basic fundamental discovery from uh, the random group uh, at the University of Florida. Um, and then Christopher Pearson's group and many others have thought hard about the DNA and how R loops can uh, create issues with the RNA coming back in and causing issues with expansion. And then something that's always important for, for us to think about is that we don't know everything, what's happening at the molecular level. We have to keep investigating that and understanding what's happening. Um, and so that's why we have the question mark, because we're certain we're still missing things. We have a lot of the framework, but there's things missing. Okay. And so, you know, this toxic RNA sequesters the MBNL proteins. And and as I said, MBNL is this critical regulator of lots of processes. It's important for de developmental processes and it's important for your muscles working properly. And so when muscle blind gets sequestered away to the toxic RNA, you have sort of all those downstream effects and, and there's other things. And, but you can, under the microscope in the lab, we can literally see this, these aggregates, this toxic RNA forming. So as you can see in these blue nuclei in the cell, you can see these little foci, and this is the toxic RNA and the MBNL proteins. And when you don't have the toxic RNA, you don't have these, these foci there. You don't have this toxic RNA there. And that's one of the things that hopefully you guys all take away from this talk, that this is a big part of what we wanna attack is the toxic RNA and get rid of it if possible. Okay, and this ties it back to uh, directly to the mechanisms that, that we think about. And this is, you know, uh, 
work that has been worked out now for many years. Um, and it gets back to this muscle blind protein. So muscle blind is a, is a RNA binding protein and it interacts with RNA normally. And what it normally should be doing in the cell is you transcribe a gene and you regulate that transcript so that you make the right RNA to make the right protein. And MBNL helps that happen. But when MBNL is gone, okay, you don't make the right RNA and you don't make the right protein and you're missing, we'll call this, the, it's the chloride channel protein. And when you're missing that protein, you, you're missing it and it leads directly to the myotonia. So some key work from uh, Thurman Wheeler, an MDF fellow, I believe, and, and Charles Thornton and others showed that just correcting in a mouse model and in cells, if you correct the misplacing of this uh, chloride channel directly, you can, you can rescue the myotonia. Again, that's a rescue in a mouse model or cells. Um, but that's, so understanding that mechanism is really important for understanding the disease mechanism. So this is just one aspect of what MBNL does. So MBNL is regulating this one gene, this one RNA of the chloride channel, and it should be doing that. But when it gets sequestered, the toxic RNA is not doing that. And many groups, including Eric Wang's and Maury Swanson's, have shown that MBNL is regulating hundreds of things in the cell, or maybe even thousands. So really, lots of things are going awry. So there's lots of RNA processing that's not working correctly. So those are the, the things that you have to sort of uh, uh, correct when you think about correcting uh, the disease mechanism in myotonic dystrophy. OK, so there's that myotonia that we've been talking about. Um, so when MBNL is sequestered uh, improperly, you um, don't make the chloride channel protein because it, it, MBNL is not regulating things properly and it's making the incorrect RNA. So as I said, in myotonic dystrophy, MBNL is sequestered by the toxic RNA, hence cannot regulate the RNA processing properly, leading to the failure of that chloride protein. And as I said, we the field has done really beautiful experiments to show if you just rescue this, you rescue the myotonia. So, but you know, really we wanna rescue not just the myotonia because when we talk to the families and the patients, it's much more than the myotonia. So it's really about getting rid of that toxic RNA. Okay, so this is a review from uh, Lucas Schneider in the Swanson Group uh, at the University of Florida. And he has a nice summary of sort of all the, splicing events we know, but there's many that are unknown where we've been able to, as I told you about the, this specific gene that is misregulated that leads to the myotonia. We know for the muscle weakness, the myopathy, that there's many genes that are misregulated. We have a couple linked to the muscle wasting. We don't know yet what's the respiratory, what causes respiratory failure issues or the myelasia. Um, cardiac muscle, there's a few transcripts identified, but it's probably many more than this. So this hopefully gives you the idea that you know many of us are thinking about this and working on understanding what's happening at the molecular level to sort of keep building the house to understand sort of all the parts of the house so that we have a better understanding of the disease mechanism and i would say one of the areas where many people are working on uh, john day and many uh think people thinking about the central nervous system and the brain are the are the transcripts or the genes that are not working properly uh, due to that toxic RNA. And just one is, is the cognitive decline, MAP, uh, MAP-T, and some of those exons have been tied to potentially cognitive uh, declines. But there's many unknown, and this is an active area of investigation. Oh, sorry about that. All right. Um, let me keep going here. Just to uh, provide a little more of that foundation that we're building for you. Um, there's been so much great work. I just want to highlight Here's your little mouse model to represent all the, all the great mouse research being done. There's lots of work. So again, I apologize to those in the field that I'm not highlighting their work. I would say one of the key uh, findings was out of Dr. Charles Thornton's lab at the University of Rochester, where they did this beautiful, elegant experiment where they put CTG repeats, those the repeats that cause the disease, they put them behind a human skeletal actin promoter and put them in the context of that human skeletal actin promoter and just put them in the mouse. It's not in normal, the normal gene context, but having those repeats in the mouse created a mouse with some of the same phenotypes as what people, uh, what the uh, patients with myotonic dystrophy suffer from. So it really gave us a powerful tool 
uh, to understand. And that's actually what many groups, ours included, use this uh, Thornton HSA LR mouse model to test our therapeutic strategies in the field to see, okay, you know, does, are, we, are we able to knock down the toxic RNA or correct splicing in the mouse model? Um, Laura Ranham's group uh, at the University of Florida identified the unstable CCTG repeat. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. But that was actually a key finding in 2001 that showed, look, it's a different repeat in a different part of the genome. And actually, the key thing is it's a toxic RNA. It sequesters the muscle binding protein. So it's really this toxic RNA. And the symptoms are similar, not the same. But that's why it's called myotonic dystrophy type 2, because it's a different gene and it's a slightly different repeat, right? CCTG instead of CTG repeats. Um, Dr. Hamshers and Brooks groups identified the MBNL proteins as being sequestered by the toxic CUG repeats in the 2000s. Uh, the Cooper and Thornton groups found that RNA processing defects and DM lead to the chloride channel defects and the myotonia. I really actually ran through that previously. Didn't quite get my slides organized perfectly. Um, and then Dr. Swanson's group developed some key MBNL knockout mouse models with the, that had recapitulated some of the same uh, phenotypes or in a sense, mouse symptoms, but it's what's happening in the mouse compared to the humans. Sort of those cataracts, the, the, uh, the splicing defects. Um, so really modeling the disease um, and I would say that's one of the real strengths of the myotonic tissue field is we have amazing mouse models that really model the disease. And in every other disease fields, some of the mouse models are not nearly as powerful and robust as what we have in the DM field. So I would say that's one of our real strengths in the field. So DM2, you know, this, as I said, a really important finding from uh, Laura Ranham's group uh, in collaboration with uh, John, Day, uh, John Day's group at Stanford. All, actually, all this work was done at Minnesota. And this, as I said, was a completely different gene, different, re, different part, you know, different chromosome. And there's these repeats. It leads to a toxic RNA. Uh, as I said, a little milder disease course, different sort of symptoms. And I think during the conference, uh, there hopefully are other um, uh, presentations where I'll go into deeper detail on this. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. The key thing is that DM2 and DM1 have very similar disease mechanisms. And so I would, I would say one of the things for those with DM2 to be um, hopeful about is the things we learn in DM1 do translate to DM2. You know, frequently we are going to have to re-engineer therapeutic strategies, but there's a lot to be learned from DM1 that will translate to DM2. Okay, so sort of getting closer, we're in the 2010s. Um, you know, actually this was published in 2009, again, from the Thornton Lab, beautiful work with antisense oligos. Many of you have probably heard of these ASOs. They're really just small modified nucleic acids. And Ionis, they used to be called Isis. They changed their name, as you might imagine, to Ionis. Um, and they and other groups have done sort of nice work to modify these little pieces of DNA or RNA so that they're stable. And they can go in and basically block or destroy the toxic RNA, okay? And this is in that HSAL mouse I was telling you about where it has the toxic RNA. You get rid of it with this ASO, okay? And it's a way to, to remove that toxic RNA. And I would say this is a big area of study for many. And just to highlight, this was a phase one, phase two safety study uh, with Ionis and Biogen uh, that was done in 2015. Okay, just to say that uh, this was a really uh, important discovery and interesting discovery that I think many people are still sort of wanting to continue to understand how it may have an impact in DM. And this is something that impacts many other repeat diseases. And it's this repeat associated non-ATG or RAN translation from the random lab at the University of Florida. And it's sort of fascinating because many of us used to think it was just this toxic RNA that really was the driver. And Laura's group sort of said, hey, wait a minute, it may not just be toxic RNA, but there could be toxic protein. And they showed um, in some beautiful work that you actually create proteins where we didn't expect them, and we call them RAN proteins. And you can see them you know, in patient samples. And so they're there, and they are toxic. You know, Exactly in myotonic dystrophy, what their level of sort of role in the diseases, we're still figuring that out. So a really important uh, open question still, I would say. Okay, and just to sort of wrap up, 
you know, all this basic work really sets the stage for being able to be strategic with therapeutics because, you know, first you have to understand where the, the repeat disease or the disease is, the mutation, that repeat expansion, CTG or CCTG for DM2, right? And then you think about sort of what happens, you know, once you make RNA, sort of what the RNA looks like. It's a toxic RNA, this gain of function. Um, I'm, I didn't spend too much time here, so I'm going to sort of not spend too much time. But, you know, you have toxic RNA. It can sequester MBNL. And actually something I didn't have time to talk about, but it may not just be MBNL. There's other proteins potentially involved. Spend a little time on this RAN translation can create cytotoxicity. RNA misprocessing, you may hear about this as a, uh, you know, a spliceopathy. There's lots of missplicing. I decided not to spend a ton of time talking about splicing. I really want to sort of try and stay a little bit sort of at the higher picture in, you know, looking at the forest, not deep in the forest. Um, okay. And I just wanted to say, I want to make sure I ended with some time, plenty of time for questions. Most, really importantly, I want to say Drs. John Cleary and Kalak Reddy. Um, I forgot the KLAC part, but Drs. John Clear and KLAC Reddy, past MDF fellows, um, rock stars in the field, and then a current MDF fellow, Carl Shotwell, helped create the majority of these slides. I just did some tweaks. And then something that I'm really excited about, and I just want to announce to the community, um, in collaboration with Charles Thornton and Rochester, we are creating a new myotonic dystrophy center in New York. It doesn't mean it's New York centric, but it sort of helps to build something that you know, hopefully we can get the state excited about. And I should say what sort of motivated this, this idea was that uh, in the state of New York, autism really is thought about and the state funds autism research and sort of efforts. And I want to do the same thing around myotonic dystrophy. I think, you know, Rochester and the RNA Institute, we have the possibility to do that. Right now with COVID, there may not be a lot of uh, opportunities, but we just need to be patient and, and do that and sort of uh, build this center. And, you know, and we'll of course collaborate with people across, across the country and across the world, which we already do. We were on a call just yesterday with folks in Quebec to talk about research with them, uh, DM research. And, and I just wanna say, again, so honored to be a part of this conference and, and enjoy, and I look forward to questions and I'm gonna stop there. All right, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here, oops. Screen sharing has stopped. Okay, now I can look at questions. Hopefully everyone can still hear me. Um, okay. Um, I'm gonna start with the, oh gosh, there's a lot of questions. Um, let's see. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, the first question from Louise. I hope I'm saying your name right. Is there anticipation in DM2 or only in DM1? Excellent question. In general, we tend to see anticipation only in DM1. Um, I am not, I should know the answer to that, but I have not read a lot of studies about anticipation in DM2. Um, there may be, it may be much more milder, but it's definitely there in DM1. But that's an excellent question, and um, maybe one of my colleagues can chime in in the chat to help me out. Um, Oh, the analogy helps, the tree analogy. Great, good to hear that. Uh, okay, um, let's see. So I'm gonna just read out the question. So if you offer a treatment, how do, how do we fix the problem in different areas for different people? Yeah, that, that, you know, I'm gonna take a stab at that, but I think some of the next talks will help you with that as well. You know, I think one of the things we need to think about um, is, you know, thinking about therapeutic strategies, you know, it's not going to probably be one, one, one treatment for everyone. You know, we have to think sort of strategically for different people, for different sort of uh, areas. You know, you may think about uh, a treatment that may help just for the muscles, or you may think about treatments that maybe is delivered systemically. And then you want to think about treatments uh, that sort of knock down dramatically the toxic RNA, but you also have to be careful that it doesn't sort of overshoot things. Um, I don't know if I'm really answering that question, but uh, but it is things we think about. I, so I may not be nailing that. Um, 
Yeah, well, well actually, how do you, this is good. So how do you titrate the treatment to the tissue? You know, we, I would say that's something, actually Eric and I have talked a lot about Wang, but we also, you know, you could imagine if you can think about sort of, um, you know, say in one tissue, there's higher levels of the toxic RNA versus another tissue. But if you have something that's turning down the toxic RNA, you know, it should turn it down sort of, you know, it has enough capacity to turn down when it's higher and so or say in the muscle tissue versus another tissue where it's lower. But hopefully you're, you know, think about the ASO as a, as a molecular scissor that you can use to, to target the toxic RNA and degrade it. So hopefully those types of molecular uh, therapeutics can sort of trim down the toxic RNA. Um, let's see. Um, my only symptom is an electrical system in my heart. Uh, it's, you know, it, it, it's possible that, you know, you have a little larger repeats in the heart. And so that is, is giving you those symptoms. It could be just you know, again, this gets back to that, that what I said early on is that there is a really wide range and people are affected differently. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah, those, are, those are one of the open questions. We don't understand why some people are affected in one area and not other areas. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hard to know uh, exactly why. Um, let's see. Um, there are, I wonder how a patient with DM2 can find out how many repeats they have. Those are, um, there are molecular assays for that. Um, you know, I think one of the things that universities and others will do is, you know, they're looking for, you know, the community to engage with them in research. Um, you know, I think uh, hopefully there's folks at the MDF that can help connect you with people that might be willing to, to do that in terms of uh, as part of a research program. Uh, I, I'm not I assume there may be companies out there that you can do that with as well. Um, and maybe even sometimes with your clinician, they may be able to get those types of measurements. Uh, how tight is the correlation between number of repeats and severity of, of disease? You know, and uh, this is from Bill. Uh, oh, and I, I forgot to say uh, the last question was from Irina Perez. Um, so Bill, it's, it's actually a tighter correlation with the misplicing. So the repeats, because they're so variable, uh, it's hard to, um, to, to have a good correlation with repeats. There's a very loose correlation. In general, the much larger the repeats, the more severe the disease. But actually, there's a tighter correlation with the misplicing. And, and we and many others can make measurements from muscle biopsies or other things where we can correlate the misplicing to uh, muscle weakness and other types of things. So it really actually correlates more with misplicing or those changes at the RNA level. Charles Thornton and Masuki Nakamura did a beautiful first paper that sort of nailed that in 2013. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, a question regarding congenital DM2, I, I don't know what the question is. I'm gonna scroll down. Um, okay, so Phil asks, where does the research stand in eliminating toxic RNA? There is, you're gonna hear that from Eric Wang. Uh, in the next talk, but there are a lot of companies, a lot of uh, academic researchers thinking about this. There's a lot of different approaches. Uh, Paul, to all panels, is correct that repeats expand over age, and if repeats expand on land, this then downside gene descending. Um, huh. You know, Paul, that's, that's a neat idea, so I'll just read it out loud. It's is it correct that repeats expand over age, and if repeats expand on cell division, does slowing down cell division help in slowing down? The anticipation of disease with exercise may be known as a way to slow aging or perhaps intermittent fasting or will at least give the body a way of dealing with toxic RNA and proteins you know I, I think those would be great studies to do we haven't done those studies that's sort of one of those areas where you know we should do those types of studies so it, it, we need to do the studies but it's a nice one uh, let's see uh, Suzanne sending me is there um, there is, so can you, knocking down approach for DM. Um, yeah, so Eric Wang, I encourage all of you to go to Eric's talk. Uh, he's going to talk a lot about that, those therapeutic strategies to knock down the toxic RNA. Many of us are thinking about it. It's, it's, it's a great strategy. That's why all that fundamental basic research was critical for understanding the disease mechanism so we could think strategically about how to knock it down. Um, 
I'm get, Mary Lou and Carl, I'm, I'm gonna get, have to circle back to that one. I don't know uh, too much about lowering the levels of homocysteine and if this could help slow the progression of DM1. Uh, oh, um, Denise Bental from Australia, you know, 25 years ago was a long time ago and it could have been that um, not tending to expand in the family. So it is possible, there is a small subset of repeats where they, I didn't want to, I didn't talk about it because it's, it's a very interesting area, but there is a subset of patients where they have um, uh, interruptions in the repeat and that tends to decrease the anticipation or even eliminate it. Um, so, th so it's not, you know, nothing's 100%. So there could be, there are individuals out there where anticipation is going to be much less. So that is a possibility. Um, why does the CTG expansion persist in one allele but not integrate into both alleles? That's an excellent question, Razir. Um, there's not crossover. So they're, they're in a sense, they're different. They're, they don't tend to cross over because if you had crossover, then yes, you could have that type of stuff happening. But they're independent alleles, yeah. Uh, also question from the main website for DM2 muscle weakness. Do you think it would be a full cure if you could get rid of the toxic RNA? Would you stay at whatever level you were then? Um, that, you know, I would, I, you know, until we, until we see some clinical trials, I, I, I want to be careful to make any predictions. You know, I, I, I want to say I'm optimistic and I'd be hopeful that, you know, with a, with something that eliminates toxic RNA, you would see, uh, an improvement, but you know it's it's hard to know. That's why we have to do those studies in those clinical trials. Can a person who does not have DM but come from a family that has DM pass it on to their children? If you if 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 at the molecular level someone does a study and says you do not have the repeats, you are not going to pass it on. You know if your parents had it but you didn't inherit it, if you don't have those repeats, you're not going to pass it on. That was uh, from. Uh, it looks like it was from Suzanne, and but it maybe came from someone else. Uh, and Denise has a question, are there therapies to reduce toxic RNA and they're available? No, not yet. Denise, I wish there were. We're working hard on that. Lots of people are. Uh, can therapeutic treatment take symptoms back to normal or is it intended to stop progression? Yeah, disease. Oh, sorry. I'm sure I butchered your name. Really sorry about that. We don't we have to do the studies, you know, until we have drugs, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, yeah. Uh, it's uh, from Alita. It, it, it's possible. It is. It's very rare for congenital DM2, but it is possible. I don't want to rule that out. Um, oh, okay. Another from the main site. Uh, what is the function of the DMPK gene? So this I didn't spend time on, but it's sort of really interesting because actually it, when it was first discovered in 1992, people um, named it dystrophia myotonia protein kinase because the assumption was the repeats right, you know, basically in the gene was causing the kinase not to function properly. But actually people ruled that out. And as I talked about that, sort of putting the repeats outside of the context of the DMPK gene showed that that was sort of the disease mechanism. So it's an important kinase but actually people have shown that if you knock that kinase out in at least in a mouse model, there's not a strong effect. So it's an important regulator. It, it, the kinase, it's, a, it's something that adds things to protein. So it's a regulatory protein. Um, so yeah, sort of interesting question about what is the DNVK gene? Uh, um, okay, let's see, I, I'm getting a little overwhelmed, let's see. Um, Hey, Suzanne, if there's like, oh, actually, I'm getting near the end. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so if, uh, why is anticipation stronger in women than in men? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. That's an area of, of active investigation because I think what this, um, what you're asking is, is why, in, why does it tend to be the case that when the mother has a child that is congenital, well, when the father has the child, it's, it's not congenital basically. And we're still wanting to understand that at the molecular level, it may have to do with um, at, the, at, the, at the level of the egg, but those are still open questions. 
Um, could you briefly explain the toxic RNA versus repeat numbers and contribution to severity of disease in DM1? When you talk about misplacing, do you mean that it results in truncated transcripts and proteins? Natalie, excellent questions. Um, so the toxic RNA versus repeat number. So if you have, let's, let's say there's a thousand CTG repeats. You're going to transcribe that into an RNA that has a thousand CUG repeats. That's going to be a pretty big toxic RNA. It's going to soak up all the MBNL proteins. And MBNL should be regulating splicing of hundreds of other genes, not, not DMPK, hundreds of others. And then what happens is you can have truncated transcripts, and then you can have truncated proteins, or you can have a transcript that doesn't even get spliced properly, and then you don't even make the protein. Right, so you can sort of have all the possibilities happening. So it sounds like you have a little bit of a molecular background. Great question, Natalie. Um, or maybe a lot molecular background. Um, yeah, Christina, hell, this is a great question. I've heard people experiencing worsening symptoms after an injury or a very stressful time. How can this be explained? Another, it's an area of, uh, it needs to be an area of active uh, investigation. It could have to do with regeneration. So the MBNL protein, it's getting sequestered away from that toxic RNA. It's been shown to have a role in differentiation and regeneration and, and, and all that. And so it could be that because you have that toxic RNA, it's, it's messing up that process of, of regeneration and, and healing. So yeah, that, that's the idea. We have, we have to test that, that hypothesis in the, in the lab and, and using models. Um, um, uh, from the main site, there's recent data that shows that DMPK functions preventing oxidative stress and other positive functions on mitochondria. Uh, thank you. I, I think I was aware of that, and that is important work. And, and so I think where that potentially has a role is because of the toxic RNA, only one allele of DMPK is being made. So you may have a slight decrease in the amount of DMPK being made. And so since you don't have maybe the full complement of the DMPK protein, it could have a, an impact in terms of uh, oxidative stress and uh, other positive functions in the mitochondria. So, you know, that, that, is a, that it could be a concern, and those are things that people think about. If you eliminate the toxic RNA, you're eliminating, in a sense, uh, part of that DMPK, DMPK pool. You do have your unaffected allele of DMPK. So, um, are there ways to upregulate MBNL protein without knocking down the transcriptional RNA? Yes, there are. There are people uh, studying, looking for small molecules or, or thinking about other approaches where you upregulate MBNL. So if you could actually do that, that would be great. You could also think about gene therapy where you deliver MBNL using some type of uh, you know, viral uh, system to deliver MBNL. Um, and I've been told that retinal detachment is not associated with DM, but many of my family members with DM have had a detached retina. Is it known to be associated with DM? Uh, uh, Denise, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I'm sorry, I just don't know. Yeah, that's one of the things I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe one of the clinicians in, in the, at the MDF conference or others can help with that. I don't. Um, Dr. Berglund, um, yeah. excuse me, I'm so sorry, but I believe the session is going to cut off any minute because we're over our time. Um, if you want to let people know if they can answer, if you want to answer questions through email or any other way, um, that'd be great. Yep. Uh, um, you know what? Happy to answer some questions via email. Hopefully my email is somewhere on the MDF website or in this meeting. But if not, you Google me and it'll come up. So yeah, and I had a lot of fun. Thank you.